All right, this is really a, also going to be a two-part presentation. Um, so we're going to look at Thomas Herka's article, The Justification of National Partiality. And um, this article is written partially in response to Alistair McIntyre's piece that we've covered, Is Patriotism is a Virtue? Yeah. I just fumbled that. Alistair McIntyre's article we just read, Is Patriotism a Virtue? So um, that's one of the reasons why I selected it. I also selected it just because I thought it had some interesting arguments on its own. And it also touches into a broader debate, not just between patriotism and uh, about patriotism, but just about different ways of conceiving morality. So, okay, so let's just uh, dive right in. Um, some initial thoughts. One, Herka, if you read the article, I hope you did, he seems to agree with McIntyre that the moral issues concerning nationalism uh, patriotism. He's, as far as I can tell, they mean the same thing to Herka. Herka's nationalism is the same thing as McIntyre's patriotism. That is, well, as far as I can tell, they stem the moral issues concerning them stem from their uh, basically required partiality. So patriots or nationalists care more about their own members than members of other groups. Uh, Canadians care more about Canadians than Americans. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that partiality is obvious. So what happens uh, in political debates? Uh, well, do such and such policy would result in jobs leaving this country. We, members of our own country, citizens of the United States, would lose jobs if we institute such and such policies. It's just a free trade agreement from with another country. Never mind the fact that members of the other country might benefit from that free trade agreement and that their quality of, quality of life might increase. It's that would harm us, members of our group, insiders, Americans, or whatever nationality we're talking about at the time. Um, we want to protect American soil, America's interests. Um, and I, I see this partiality on both the left and the right in contemporary politics with Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Republicans and Democrats both want there to be jobs in the United States specifically, and they want the job. Uh, Republicans say that various um, regulations and legislate, uh, legislative, uh, legislative decisions that restrict business in the United States will lead to jobs leaving the United States to uh, countries that have less regulations. So it's not, in, and you know, that means less jobs for United States citizens. Whereas Democrats say that many greedy corporations in the United States uh, because there are no regulations and are only concerned with profit, end up treating their um, workforce and the citizens around them poorly. Uh, which, again, benefits the citizens of the United States, specifically. So, um, I, I find evidence for this on both sides. Okay, uh, so what's the situation? And I'm not talking about the guy from Jersey Shore. The question is, is this partiality? So, like I said, this partiality is on both sides on our political spectrum. Uh, which doesn't completely map onto the spectrum of moral views, but the um, question is, is it justified or not? Is the partiality assumed by patriotism justified or not? Pretty simple question. It's basically it's similar to the question McIntyre asked. Is patriotism a virtue or a vice? Um, so, Herka draws attention to justified partiality, which I've already brought up in the lecture on McIntyre. So, for example, we show partiality towards our own family members. It's a good thing that your mother cares more for you than other children. And your father gave more money towards your own family, or your mother towards your own family, whoever worked, than other families. We want that type of partiality. It's not just a justified, a morally justified partiality. We'd say it's an obligatory type of partiality. You better take care, better care of your own children than other people's children, or your friends. Okay, so that's justified partiality. There's also unjustified partiality. The most obvious example, which Herka draws attention to, is racism. That's partiality shown towards members of your own race. So, the question is, is nationalism more like the partiality you show towards your family or more like the partiality that you show towards members of your own race? Is it, uh, that is, what specifically about partiality towards family? What is it specifically about partiality towards family that is justifiable and about and partiality concerning race that is not justifiable? Which is... Really, just to ask, what in general justifies partiality? When, uh, when is partiality justified or not? So, if you can, um, I guess, in a sense, one strategy you could use, and this is to 
if you could get out your philosophical microscope and zoom in towards partiality shown towards family members, and zoom in towards partiality shown towards members of your own race, and locate the ingredient or element in both, the one that makes it good with family and the one that makes it bad with race, then you could, you know, you've made a, say, a philosophical discovery, and then you could do the same thing with patriotism. You could kind of take a look at patriotism and see if it has one or the other ingredient, and then that would answer your question. So in a sense, this is kind of what we're going to do in this exercise. It's a conceptual exercise. Uh, it's a cheesy educational analogy, this you know, conceptual moral microscope. But I don't know, I'm hoping you get the idea though, of what we're doing. So some caveats. And I just learned how to pronounce caveat. Uh, you can make fun of me for how I mispronounce words from occasion, but I'm more educated than you. <laughs> All right, so caveats. Um, Herka's only going to be concerned with universalist nationalism. This is the view that all people ought to be partial to their own nation and co-nationals. Um, so universalist nationalism holds that all people ought to be partial to their own nation. So if you're a universalist nationalist, you believe not only that Americans should be partial to Americans, but you believe Frenchmen should be partial to Frenchmen, Algerians should be partial to Algerians, and so on. Two, Herka's only concerned with what he calls intrinsic justifications of nationalism. I guess where nationalism is justified in and of itself, not as may, simply merely as a means to some other good, which there are justifications of nationalism, I guess in a kind of in, what's called an instrumental sense. They're an instrument towards some other type of good. He's not concerned with that, although there are philosophers that defend that. Okay, so his article addresses three topics. One, he challenges what he calls the embedded selves view of the moral foundations of nationalism. So McIntyre defends an example of that. Um, and then the other two parts, and that's the part that we're going to look at in this video. The other two parts are he makes a positive case for what he thinks nationalism is. Um, that is, so and he thinks that nationalism has two components. And then he ends up in the third part of this article giving a defense of one of those components. So in this lecture, we're going to look at topic one, nationalism and embedded selves. So his target, as I mentioned before, was McIntyre, but other philosophers as well, who uh, I guess they're, they're all part of a common moral genre, and they argued that nationalism can be justified only by, I mean, they, sorry, they argued that nationalism cannot be justified by an enlightenment or liberal conception of morality. Okay, so recall the liberal, what we call the liberal conception of morality, not politically liberal like a Democrat, but uh, the Enlightenment morality. So, for example, John Rawls' veil of ignorance, the original position, or utilitarianism or consequentialism. Um, so, these embedded selves theorists hold that patriotism could not be justified by that kind of morality. And that is who, so they have a target, and then Herc is targeting them. So there's a, a lot of guns being pointed, or philosophical guns being pointed at each other. But it's, uh, I'll just break it down. So the um, McIntyre and other embedded selves theorists target philosophical liberals like Rawls. Herka targets the embedded selves theorists. Okay, and he probably counts as a philosophical liberal, so he's just he's got the gun pointed right back at McIntyre. All right, so that's the target. And um, I'm using, like, Weaponry analogies, uh, for those of you that aren't fans of those, at least I'm not using sports analogies. You don't hear many of those in philosophy classes. I've heard them in other contexts, but at least I'm not using the example of football in this lecture. But, um, but basically, oftentimes in a well-written philosophy article, uh, I mean, one thing we philosophers do is we critique other views. Not people, but views. So you have to hone in on just what is being critiqued. Um, okay, so that's what we're doing. So, according to Herka, these philosophers hold that patriotism slash nationalism is inconsistent with Enlightenment morality. While it is not only consistent, but actually justified by what Herka calls their embedded selves view of morality. Where morality necessarily arises within the life of particular communities, and therefore inevitably distinguishes between members and outsiders, requiring that priority be given to the insiders. Okay, so that's um, 
Well, you read the McIntyre article. That's the view that McIntyre spends a great deal of time elaborating upon, and we've discussed in the lectures on McIntyre as well. So, he's going to give then two arguments, or he's going to assess, I'm sorry, Herkin is going to assess, kind of weigh uh, two arguments that have been given by embedded selves theorists like McIntyre to defend the view that patriotism can only be defended by this embedded self view of morality. Which um, So one is what he calls the cultural perfectionist argument, and two is what he'll call the meta-ethical particularist argument. All right, well, let's take a look at the cultural perfectionist argument first. Uh, before we do that, we should look at this broader moral normative view, I suppose, called perfectionism, uh, of which cultural perfectionism is a type. So it's an, perfectionism is a normative view that holds that the good for human beings consists in developing their nature or identity. Um, that certain properties that make an individual what he or she is, constituting their nature or identity. So, um, so, you know, physical fitness would definitely be a human property. And perhaps a part of perfecting your human nature, becoming more fit, becoming smarter, uh, learning another language, for example. If you have particular talents, like you have a musical talent, part of your perfecting would just be better at that musical instrument or singing and so on. Uh, so this is a view that in some sense is kind of obvious, but in a sense it traces back to uh, philosophers like Aristotle. So according to this view, one's good is developing those properties, such as being good at a musical instrument, into the highest degree. Uh, so it's basically like developing your potential, basically. Um, in the traditional perfectionist view, the nature is human nature, which is shared by all humans. So developing this nature is this nature that all human beings share in common. All right, so for example, humans are, you know, we're, we have a certain physiological composition. So there are some things that perfect our nature, and there are other things that do great harm to our nature. Uh, so this view is a moral view, but it's rooted in human nature and like just basically how we're built. So for example, drinking gasoline is not a way to perfect your human nature. It's a way to severely damage human nature. Uh, but, you know, like I said, learning a new language might be a way to perfect. Uh, and this also applies to like acquiring certain virtues like kindness, charity, bravery, uh, honesty. That would be a way of perfecting Okay, so cultural perfectionism. They, cultural perfectionists argue that the good consists in developing more narrow or cultural identities. So not human goods, but narrow or goods. Like American, being a good American. So your good then is to develop properties related to that narrower identity, not the broader human nature. Um, and they have a, an argument that patriotism could only be justified by cultural perfectionism. So this is their argument. This is what Herc is going to attack. Um, premise one, human beings have either Roman numeral one, just an abstract or common human nature, or Roman numeral two, identities slash a nature based on their particular cultures. All right? Premise two, if Roman numeral one, then an impartialist or cosmopolitan morality would be reasonable. Premise three, if Roman numeral two, on the other hand, then morality demands a special loyalty to your own culture. So basically, it requires patriotism. Well, premise four, it is not the case that Roman numeral one, so morality demands a special loyalty to one's own culture. So what are the arguments for premise four? That's kind of a key premise. Uh, well, Herka is partially responding to McIntyre, so a lot of the arguments are ones that we looked at when we read the McIntyre article. Um, so, let's look at Herka's critique of this argument then. And I think he is going to challenge premise three, and he's also going to challenge premise four. Uh, so he's going to take issues with premise three and with premise four. So, in other words, he's going to attack both cultural perfectionism as well as cultural perfectionism's link to patriotism. All right, so let's look first at his problems with cultural perfectionism, which will be his problems with premise four. He writes, and I quote, in the most attractive versions of this perfectionist general normative view, the properties that it is good for a human to develop constitute his or her identity in a strict metaphysical sense. 
they are essential to the person in the strong sense that he or she could not exist as numerically the same individual without having these properties. All right, well, traditional perfectionism satisfies this, while cultural perfectionism does not. What is this? It means that property is good for you to develop that constitute their identity in a strict metaphysical sense. So this is what philosophers call the problem of persistence or the problem of identity through time. So uh, we could go to some crazy puzzles. Uh, so for example, parts that are necessary for you to be who you are. All right. So if you, suppose you get your hair cut tomorrow. You're going to be different, right? You will have had long hair and now you have short hair. You've lost part of your body, your hair. But you'd still say that you are you, even though you've had your hair cut. Suppose instead that a mad scientist kidnapped you and took your brain out and replaced it with another brain. You, you wake up with someone else's memories and desires. We probably wouldn't say that you are you because you have a new brain. So your brain is kind of essential for you to be who you are, whereas we wouldn't say that your hair is essential for you. Well, it's the same thing with this cult. His Kirkus critique is going to be the of the cultural perfectionist view is going to be along those same lines. Uh, being Canadian isn't essential for you to be who you are. In the way that, like you know, being a human being is essential for you to be who you are. In ten years from now, so um, well, let's just see what he says. For example, you could have been suppose you were born in Canada and you're raised in a Canadian culture. Maybe some of you have been. Well, suppose a month before you were born, your parents moved to the United States and raised you there in the United States culture. Well, being Canadian wouldn't be essential for being like who you are in this like really robust sense of identity. Um, and, like being a human would, but being Canadian wouldn't. So he thinking like the, the type of nature or identity that really matters for moral perfectionism isn't this like a weak cultural sense? It's this more strong, robust, like metaphysical sense. What it is to be a human? Okay, he says that's what matters for moral perfectionism, because that's what constitutes your identity. So culture is kind of like hair. You can cut your hair. You can change cultures. You'll still be who you are. However, if you like stop being human, like a mad scientist injects this evil DNA formula into you and you get converted into a rooster somehow. In a sense, you won't be who you are. You, I mean, you won't be the same. You won't be identical in a sense. Uh, this brings into some bizarre science fiction scenarios. Um, so, uh, anyone ever seen the movie District 9 and the main character kind of starts transforming into an alien? Literally, changing biological nature. He's no longer human anymore. Uh, presumably, that's a, obviously the movie's like a, a, a metaphor, but if that really did happen, I think that would be much worse than getting your hair cut or, you know, finding out that you were born in Czechoslovakia instead of Canada. Okay? Just, uh, so I hope you get the point. So that's kind of what Herc is arguing. So, he also has problems with cultural perfectionism's link to patriotism. So not just, so um, and he makes, we'll just say he makes two points with that. So this is his problems with premise three. So premise three assumes that there's a link. Cultural perfectionism justifies patriotism, the partiality you find in patriotism. So what are his problems? First, he says, even if humans have different goods based on their membership in different cultures, it does not follow that one should care more about the achievement of the co-nationals, of your own co-nationals of obtaining specific cultural goods than the achievements of people in other cultures. Put it more simply, even if cultural perfectionism is true, why couldn't you care impartially about all peoples realizing their different cultural identities? So you could have a what's called an impartialist cultural perfectionism. Um, so yeah, you could agree, yeah. It, being Canadian is essential to who I am, and I could not be more culturally perfected in a morally interesting sense unless uh, I'm, I show partiality to my fellow Canadians. But 
you could still hold that. And I also think that if you're a Frenchman, you should do the same thing with French. And if you're American, you should do the same thing with Americans. Okay, I just got a text from my wife. Let me read that real quick. All right, looks like I'll be going to Chumley's tonight. Anyways, metaethical particularism is the other view argued by embedded theorists, embedded selves theorists, um, that um, to use um, claim to only be able to justify patriotism, basically. And this, of course, is going to be uh, the other target of Virgo. So uh, I'll have less to say about this. I think it's what it is and his objection to it. It's fairly straightforward. So metaethical particularism <clears throat> claims that an impartialist moral code is inconsistent with the true nature of moral codes and principles. Morality is instead always, quote, our morality. So basically, if you're a meta-ethical particularist, you couldn't take a standpoint um, outside of all cultures and you know make moral judgments. Uh, instead, it's always within a moral a culture. So the standpoint presupposed then by impartial morality, one outside of all cultures, and one that makes judgments about them all, just isn't available. Well, what's Herka's problem with them? Well, they exclude not only impartialist morality, but also universalist ethics of nationalism. So he, he writes, and I quote, for universalists to make claims about what is right in all cultures, namely partiality towards them. Their judgments too do not arise from a particular culture, but apply equally to all cultures. So recall McIntyre. Uh, if patriotism is a virtue, it's a virtue in every culture. That's what he was uh, uh, arguing, okay? But you can't argue that if you're a particularist, because that's a judgment about every culture. Um, so, this is Herkes' critique of McIntyre, then. He uses a particularist, meta-ethical view to argue for an affirmative answer to the question, is patriotism a virtue, even though it would imply that patri patriotism is a virtue in all cultures. But if you're a particularist, you can only ask, for example, is patriotism a virtue in Canada? Or is it a virtue in the United States? So that's uh, the rest of his criticism.